Greetings, I'm Ed Steinfeld, Director of the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs. Welcome to this panel discussion of All In, The Fight for Democracy, an absolutely phenomenal 2020 documentary just released, directed and produced by Liz Garbus and Lisa Cortez. I very much hope everybody in the audience has just screened the film. And if you haven't watched this film, please do so as soon as you can. It's available on Amazon and it's absolutely phenomenal. I just want to mention that today's event, uh, part of the Watson Institute and Brown Arts Initiative's JFK Jr. Initiative for Documentary Film and Social Progress, is being co-sponsored by Brown Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice, the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America, and also the Department of Africana Studies and Rights and Reason Theater. We, we're so fortunate today to be joined by two exceptional individuals, both of whom I'm going to do a terrible disservice to by describing their bi biographies only very briefly. Liz Garbus, in addition to being the producer and director of All In, is a renowned documentary filmmaker and graduate of Brown. Her films include The Farm, Angola, USA, The Ghosts of Abu Ghraib, Bobby Fischer Against the World, Love, Marilyn, and What Happened, Miss Simone. Stacey Abrams, as you all know, is a politician, attorney, voting rights activist, entrepreneur, and author. She served in the Georgia House of Representatives from 2007 to 2017, where she served as the Democratic Minority Leader. She was the Democratic Party's nominee in the 2018 Georgia gubernatorial election, the story of which you, you saw presented in the film. And in February 2019, she delivered the Democratic response to the President's State of the Union address. Thank you, thank you, thank you both so much for being here today. I know you're both super busy. Our time is brief. I know Stacey Abrams in particular, you have to leave a little bit early. So we're going to go right to questions. To those of you in the audience, please start now. Write your questions in the Q&A box. Uh, I'll monitor those and, and I'll ask both Liz and Stacey your questions. But we're going to begin right away with two questions from students in the audience whom I'll ask to, um, to, to voice their questions on screen. Uh, first, I think we're going to turn, first we'll turn to Sydney Smith, who's a student affiliated with the Center for the Study of Slavery and Justice. Sydney, why don't you go ahead and ask your question? Hi. Um, hi, Ms. Abrams. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time uh, to speak with us today um, for the work that you do and for being a role model to so many of us. Um, my name is Sydney. I'm a junior studying political science and Africana studies here at Brown. Um, in many of the communities that I'm a part of, uh, especially young people and people of color, a lot of us are angry uh, and exhausted by the continued disregard and assault on American democracy, specifically the routine violence uh, inflicted upon Black people. Besides voting in every election, what else do you think we can do to make our claims to personhood and citizenship legible? What can we do between election cycles to make real the American promise of freedom and equality? Or do you think that voting's enough? Well, first of all, Sydney, thank you so much. I, I wanna acknowledge that while I am not a graduate of Brown, my younger sister, Leslie, is a class of 97. And when I was in law school, I often had to drive down and get her because I was the one with a car. Uh, so I was in Connecticut, so I got to spend a lot of time on Brown's campus. Um, Please come back anytime. <laughs> absolutely. But Sydney, your, your question is very sincere, and the reality is no, voting is not enough. And anyone who tells you different isn't telling you the truth. Voting is a part of a process, and I liken it to chemotherapy. We have the cancer of poverty, the cancer of racism, the cancer of inhumanity. We have a cancer of systemic injustice and we keep seeing a recurrence of it. We never seem to go fully into remission and part of the treatment is painful. It's almost as painful sometimes it feels as the disease itself, but voting is a part of it. But another part of it is protest. I, I've disagreed with those who have decried protest and said, just go vote. That's not the answer. My parents took us to protest, they took us to vote, and then they told us, they, they took us to know, to, they took us with them when they went to go and confront the people who'd been hired. This is a cycle, and the cycle begins by demanding what we need, it continues by hiring the people who can deliver it, and then it finds its fullest fruition when we hold them accountable. And so I say protest at the poll, protest at the in the streets, protest at the ballot box, and then protest in the halls of power. I, I am an itinerant politician, uh, but when I'm in office and when I'm out, I tell people, 
politicians are like 15 year old girls and I use girls because I was one 15 once long ago. We respond to money, peer pressure and attention. And often money is how we get into office. Attention is what we demand when we're in office and the peer pressure is what keeps us going. But if we don't, especially young people, if you don't show up in the halls of power, it is easy to ignore you. It's like giving someone a job, handing them the keys to the cash register, and then assuming they're not gonna steal, rob you blind in the four years while you're away. And so we have to show up in the places where decisions are being made. And this is the last thing I'll say. When I was in college, when the Rodney King verdict came down, that was the first time we had seen captured on film the reality of police brutality in my generation. But I'd grown up in Mississippi, I knew all about it. I had cousins who'd faced it. I had relatives who'd faced it. But what I knew was that it wasn't enough to vote. It wasn't enough to protest. I did both. But I also went to zoning committee meetings because I lived at Spelman College, which sat cheek by jowl with one of the oldest housing projects in Georgia. And there was an institution of higher learning and a housing development that was facing the ravages and the pathologies that were being inflicted upon it, in part because it was zoned to put liquor stores every five feet. And I would go to these nicer parts of town and there would be none. I knew that it wasn't enough to be angry about the liquor stores. I had to go to the zoning committee meetings and protest the siting. And so one of the pieces of power that we allied to often or worse, we just abdicate, is that we can show up where the decisions are being made, make them make you leave, make them tell you no. But when we tell ourselves no by thinking that voting is the end of the process, we have already started to lose. Thank you. Absolutely. Thank you. We're going to turn to Latasha Rogers, a student in the Watson Institute's Master of Public Affairs program. Latasha. Hi, Stacy. Um, my question is, seeing that many government officials continue to disenfranchise black and brown voters, despite the will of the people and advocacy efforts, what keeps you motivated? So I, I am privileged to be one of the producers on this film because I got to meet Liz Garvis. And when I was interviewing folks to talk about, you know, how could we make this film, I met a lot of people who were interested, but Liz was the one who had the clearest understanding of how to tell this story in a way that could remind us of where we started and where we are. I take hope from the fact that we're not still fighting the battle that Maceo Snipes died to fight. That we are not still fighting the fights that Native Americans were fighting to be recognized as citizens in 1924. That my parents who were in the civil rights movement, my, my dad was arrested I'm not being arrested trying to gain access to the right to vote. I'm in, I'm in trouble because I'm trying to protect that right. But what gives me hope is that there has been progress. And what Lisa and Liz did so beautifully in this film was show us what progress looks like. I want people to be angry about how far we still have to go, but I want them to take comfort in the fact that we have come so far already. And what All In does extraordinarily well is give light and life to that progress. Because what gives me hope are those young people in that film, Jayla and others. What gives me hope is my friend Desmond, who is still fighting to make certain that returning citizens have the right to vote. What make, gives me hope is that young man from Dartmouth, who may not share a political lineage with me, but who understands that his voice matters. That's what gives me hope. And that's why I think this film is so important. Thank you. Absolutely. Thanks. Liz and Stacy. could you both talk a little bit about how you connected on this film. H how did that happen? Well, as Stacy said, um, you know, and I was I was frozen for a little bit, so I didn't get I got to hear Stacy's answers, but not the questions. But um, yeah, Stacy came to New York and it was like, well, uh, let me rewind for a second. I was walking around my office and somebody said in the in one of the assistants said, you know, we just got a call from UTA. Uh, would you guys like to talk to Stacey Abrams about making a film about voting? And I literally, I thought it was a prank call. I mean, it was like, it was a dream come true. After the 2016 election, I had been thinking about how, you know, because 
one of the things that was missing in the conversation about the 2016 election, and I had followed Ari Berman's work, was you know people were talking a lot about how Black Americans hadn't turned out in the same numbers for Hillary Clinton. And it elided the fact that the Shelby County decision was in full force by 2016 in terms of all the new ID laws that we talk about in the film, which disproportionately affect um, black and brown communities. And it seemed like that was a missing piece of the conversation. I didn't know how to make a whole film out of that idea, but I was really intrigued by it. When Stacy came to meet with us, um, once I decided that it was real and she actually showed up in the office and she was a real human being, um, I was you know, thrilled to talk to her. In my own background, my father had been an ACLU lawyer whose early cases actually involved voting rights cases. So it was something that I grew up with was in my DNA. As a white American, I hadn't encountered a lot of problems with voting, but I understood early on that that was a privilege, not a, not a fact for Americans. So we met, Stacy had met other folks. I still don't know who they are, um, I'm so pleased that she picked, that she decided to work with us. And then I brought on my partner, Lisa Cortez. And, um, and we tricked Stacy a little bit. Um, Stacy had been approached and uh, many times about people wanting to make a film about her. And Stacy correctly, I believe, felt that, you know, once you make it all about one politician, it actually kind of loses its power because then you can write it off. You can say that's one story. But what we wanted to do was find that kind of magic hit trip, hack trick at, you connected to the power of Stacy's own journey, but you then widened the lens to see how, in fact, her story sadly was not all that unique. Um, but I think we had to sort of show Stacy how that would work in the film because she was quite reluctant. And as we sat in the th third or fourth hour of the interview, she was just like, Liz, why are you asking me that question? <laughs> we're not we're not talking about, but you know, but she played along and we were able to uh, make our case. Stacy, do you want to add, and why film? Why, why did you want to see the story told through film? So I, I write, I, I'd written, in fact, I was in the last pages of a book on voter suppression and just the arc of the story of power. And so the first half is about voter suppression, but the second half is about how we take our power back, how we use this moment of demographic change, this moment of unrest, these moments of challenge and how we win. Uh, because for so long we've, we've not been able to win because our numbers weren't great enough. But part of the, the act of writing a book is that you've got to read it, meet, you've got to reach an audience that's willing to sit through 250 pages of this narrative. I also am a deep and abiding fan of television and film. And I believe as a storyteller, you meet people where they are. And so our time is now is for folks who want to read it, want to get into the footnotes, really want to get a deep dive. Although it's a very readable book. I made it very, it moves pretty quickly. Um, but when it came to the idea of telling the story on film, it was important to me that the filmmakers be people who actually understood how to take these complicated searing narratives and convert them into something that people could absorb without reeling away from the, the, the conversation. And so I did meet with a, a few folks before I met with Liz, but what was so compelling about Liz and then Lisa was that in their individual and very separate ways, they found, the, they'd found a, a narrative arc to tell these really compelling stories in multiple layers. And what documentaries do best is teach you while entertaining you, not amusing you, but, but while keeping you engaged and for me, it was so important that we not only have a film that did it, I needed a film that could reach my grandmother, unfortunately, who passed away, but who could reach the folks my grandmother's age who are remembering what happened, but also my nieces and nephews who are not yet old enough to vote. And I, I will use this as an example. We did a family viewing on Saturday. It was the first time I'd watched the, the final cut. And my niece, who's 14, which means, you know, nothing is interesting and everyone is boring. And she watched the whole thing and she had, she occasionally made comments and she's, she's not the most talkative, but like she drew from it and she was both appalled and energized. That's the power of film to give you an hour and 30 minutes of information that makes you want to spend a lifetime trying to act. And they did an exceptional job of doing that. What an answer. That's the, that's the entire theme of our JFK film initiative. I want to go back to audience questions. There's so many of them. Uh, there's a question from Gabrielle Rogers who asks, 
how do we still keep the hope alive in fighting for the voting rights of people of color when we see that police still are not held accountable for their actions against black people as seen in Kentucky in the decision today? So one of the reasons I do what I do, and I think one of the reasons, and I don't wanna speak for Liz, but she does what she does is, we have to remember that these are building blocks. We are standing on stories and challenges and sins that came before. But one of the benefits of building blocks is that you're getting towards something bigger. This nation has always had a deep intersectional tension with justice and black bodies, with police brutality and people of color. But what is different now is that we talk about it. I grew up in the 90s. I watched that Rodney King video and by the, in April of 20, sorry, in April of 1992, that was the only thing people talked about. That decision on April 29th changed the conversation. It was gone by June. But what's happened in this moment is that we don't just have one story. And we know Rodney King's story wasn't the only one. It was just the only one caught on VHS, which was a miracle for those of you who don't understand how important that was. That was... But what we have now is a constant stream of information, but also a constant stream of action. And that's what's different now. We have more of us who can speak up and demand change, and they know it, which is why they're trying to keep us from voting. They know if we can vote in this election, things will change. People who've gotten used to their power will lose it. And that's why voter suppression has become so important, because we have finally reached this critical mass standing atop these building blocks where we can see what the future can look like, and damn it, we want it. If I could just follow up, and this is both for Stacy and Liz, it seems there's increasing concern, not just about preventing people from voting today, people of color or other people, but delegitimizing their vote after they've done it. There was just a piece in Today's Atlantic by Barton Gelman, and, and Stacy and, and Liz, what's your sense of that? What, what do we do if the move is now toward delegitimizing votes after they're uh, made? I'd like to hear Stacy's opinion on that one. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I think Gelman is not wrong that there are explorations of ways to disenfranchise. But again, there, there's a phrase that we often just sort of take for granted, but it's the consent of the governed. We don't have to consent to wrong. That's what protest is. That's what civil dis disobedience is. That's what the civil rights movement, the women's movement, the Indian movement, the Chicano movement, they were all grounded in refusing to grant consent to being governed in ways that were illegitimate and incompatible. My non-concession speech was my small, you know, consent of a governed moment. And so the delegitimization of our votes will only happen if we agree to allow it. And the reason we tend to allow it is because we didn't know we were being delegitimized, that our votes were being thrown away, our votes were being stolen. And that's why this film is so important because it brings to the fore and to the attention of the governed, here's what's being done to you. You can't fight an enemy you don't know exists. And so I'm less concerned about the, you know, conversion of electors into, you know, this sort of renegade band of, you know, electoral college de denialists. But I, I'm more concerned about making sure that absentee ballots don't get thrown out in Pennsylvania because people didn't know they had to put it inside a second envelope that may or may not have shown up. And I, you know, and I also think, you know, look, we've been, our history and even the history that's presented in this film, you know, we've, we've encountered some really hard times and we've gotten through them. Um, and, you know, I think that protest is one measure and, you know, strikes are another measure. I mean, there's a, there's a level of civil disobedience that may have to get kicked up into a different gear if these nightmare scenarios like uh, the Atlantic piece talks about come into play. Um, I mean, we saw how effective strikes were during the civil rights movement. Um, so looking to history provides us some guideposts in moving forward. Maybe I can combine two questions from the audience. One from Jesse Hogan, who asks, um, I've seen many young people formerly active in the realm of politics become so disillusioned and upset by current national ongoings that they refuse to vote. I think narratives like that in the All In documentary are powerful in creating 
perspective for those who are interested, but what sort of strategies can we employ to challenge the perspectives of those who don't have hope and maybe who've, who've become disillusioned? And there were some people, I'm just saying, in the documentary who just, they didn't trust the system anymore. They didn't want to vote. And there was a follow-up question from Luca Castrucci who asks about education. And are, are, are you worried about the quality of education that might, I'm paraphrasing, inform people about this history? So I'll take the first half and you can take okay. the second list. Does that make sense? So I believe we have to tell the truth about what voting is and what voting is not. Voting is not magic. And part of disillusionment happens because we think that an election is going to transform the outcome of our lives and it just doesn't work that way. Victory in an election doesn't make the bad people go away. They just retrench and find a new way in. And so it's, there's a permanence. And part of my, my answer to Sydney at the beginning is there's a permanence to our process because progress is always fighting against those who liked it the way it was, who were happy with what they had and don't wanna share don't want to see change, and they don't go away just because we win an election. But it's also about understanding all the systems. And so we have to be honest about what voting does. I don't tell people, you're, you, in fact, I'm very affirmative. You don't vote for saviors. I don't care if you like the person you're voting for. I want you to like their policies and trust their intentions. And then I want you to hold them accountable. And so our first job is to be honest with the disillusioned because you only can be disillusioned if you had an illusion to begin with. And so we've got to be honest from the beginning about what voting can get us. The second is we have to connect the dots. There were so many people who were angry with President Obama because Medicaid expansion didn't happen in their states. Because no one taught them that it was the governor and the lieutenant governor and the, sec and the state legislatures that were denying them access to health care. We spent trillions of dollars explaining the presidency. We spend pennies explaining where 90% of decisions happen. And so the second responsibility is to connect the dots. We can be as angry as we want to be about what happened in Kentucky today, but what we have to focus on is who got to make those decisions, who made those laws, who made those hires, who convened that grand jury, who asked the questions that no one's gonna get to see because grand jury proceedings are secret. Who does those things? We have to stop focusing so exclusively on the top that we ignore the middle and we, we refuse to, or we don't understand that the fine print on a ballot is where most of the problems happen. So you gotta go all the way to the bottom. But if we want to tackle that disillusionment, we've gotta be honest about what's possible. We've gotta be authentic and intentional about connecting the dots so people know who to hold accountable. And then we've gotta make it as easy as possible for people to intercede and say, I deserve better. Liz, do you want to comment about education and how that can be, what the quality of education can be improved to, to increase participation and awareness? Well, you know, I think that the film is part of that effort in some way. Yeah. We actually are um, partnering with Grow a Voter and, and turning all of this into a curriculum. Um, I think, you know, I was um, talking to a student uh, journalist the other day who hadn't heard of Shelby versus Holder before. Like that, that wasn't a, a case that resonated. Um, I don't think people understood exactly what was guaranteed by the Voting Rights Act that was then taken away. So I think these are really important pieces because I, as Stacy said, when you show up and you and to vote and they tell you there's a problem, you walk away. Maybe, maybe, maybe in 2020, people don't think this anymore, but I think up until now thinking, oh, I must have done something wrong. I didn't file some form. What did I do? What's on, what is empowering is to understand that, no, it's not you. You did everything right. And what are your rights in that moment and not to be turned away? So yes, education is part of that piece. And Stacey, I know time is short. Can, can, we, can I give you one more question from the audience? Absolutely. Thank you. So there's a question from Peter Kramer who asks, for, for those who want to volunteer, um, if, if you had to choose one state in which to focus your efforts for voter registration, um, which would it be? And, and this is in terms of either the presidential election or senator, senatorial campaigns. Where should people focus their efforts? And, and I'll just add, what, what should they do? What can they do? So to Liz's point, one of the things Amazon has done in cooperation with the filmmakers and, and all of us is uh, this incredible social impact campaign. Allinforvoting.com is a one-stop shop for all of the ways you can help. Because here's the thing, voter registration ends at different points in time across the country. 
Georgia, we stopped registering voters on August on October 5th, but in Oregon, you have same day registration. So you can vote the day you show up. Uh, so I would focus less on picking a state and I would focus more on picking a problem. And so if you go to that website, it will give you the problems that we have. And you don't have to be in a state to be helpful with a problem. For example, what Fair Fight does, we are helping build an army of folks to answer phones and answer questions. Just this last month, we did 1.1 million phone calls and text messages, helping voters understand what's coming up. And so we'd love to have your help there. There's powerthepolls.org. But if you go to the website, allinforvoting.com, you can get answers for everything and they can tell you the best way to help. Because here's the bottom line. Voter suppression is three things. Can you register and stay on the rolls? Can you cast a ballot? And does your ballot get counted? And it is so nefarious and so insidious because it has a different iteration in every state that practices voter suppression. And so don't try to become an expert on voter suppression. Become an expert on democracy, meaning that you are willing to participate to help shore up democracy. And there are organizations that do nothing but spend their time figuring out where we need you. So sign up with one of these groups and I promise you they're going to put you to work and you will never lack for a task. <laughs> a fantastic answer. Do you think there should be a national holiday for, for election day? I think there should, be a, there should be opportunities for everyone to have paid time off to go and vote. The problem with the national holiday is that somebody's got to work. So if, for example, for the disabled, they often have caregivers who have to go with them. We don't want them to be disenfranchised because their caregivers have to use that time. So the best um, mix is a hybrid where we make sure that we have an election season where people can vote on weekends if they need to, they can take time off from their jobs and not worry about not just being fired, but not worry about losing pay. And if we do have a national election, a national holiday just to organize the mind, that's great. But the most important is meeting us in the 21st century where people have different needs, but everyone needs to be able to vote. And on that note, I say <laughs> thank you to Brown. Thank you so much, Edward. I love Liz Garbus. She's going to tell you amazing and wonderful things. She is an extraordinary <laughs> filmmaker and an even better human. So enjoy talking to her. And thank you, Brown, for having me. Take care. Thank you so much see for being Stacey. here. <laughs> we'll see you, Stacy. But the audience shouldn't go anywhere because we still have, have Liz. Uh, so to those of you in the audience, please keep asking questions uh, of Liz and I'll keep uh, directing them to her. But I have lots of my own. You know, Liz, obviously I'm an academic. I, I, know, I know how books and articles are written, but I when I watched your film, when I watched all of your films, but when I watched All In, I just saw how incredibly complicated it is. So much historical analysis, so much archival information, then all these experts, and then a narrative, and you've got counter arguments. You have the, you know, the voice from the Heritage Foundation. And um, I don't know how to ask this, other than to say, how do you do it? What's the process for taking all of this and putting it into a film that's an hour and 40 minutes long? Well, if I told you, then everybody would do it and then I would be out of a job. No, I mean, I think it's, um, there's always this point when you're making a documentary and I'm sure it's the same when you're writing a long, an article or a book where you're like, it's just never gonna come together, right? Like how in the world am I gonna make this a seamless, elegant whole? You know, it's like the wet clay is there, but it's just all over the place. It doesn't look like one being, like one vase, you know, that the clay should come into that, come into that form. And I think in all of my years <laughs> since graduating from Brown in 1992 of doing this, what I've, you know, I've learned the kind of confidence and perseverance to get through that dark place. Um, and I, it's, and, and, and at a certain point, and it might just be like, you wake up in the middle of the night and you figured out what that connective tissue is, but um, you, you break through. Um, and for me, it was about, I mean, in All In, for example, it was about finding those intersections between past and present, right? The thesis of the film as articulated, you know, of course, by Shakespeare, but also by, by Car Professor Carol Anderson is past is prologue. And how are we constantly bringing that theme to the core? Because if, if the film, if the whole film is speaking to a theme, then it's going to feel cohesive. So if you're talking about reconstruction and then you're talking about the black codes and you're talking about how when the freed slaves, you know, were there and they started to black black Americans started to gain political power, they created new felonies in order to disenfranchise and keep uh, black Americans out of the political 
body out of the the dialectic then you can you can make that connection to what's happening in florida today right so and what other opportunities do we have to talk about you know um for instance, you know, voter intimidation that uh, happened historically in the form of lynching versus, you know, how do we connect that to um, a narrow set of IDs which exclude Americans? So it's always looking for that connective tissue so that you can make turns between past and present. Every film has its own challenges. Um, in this one, of course, we wanted to have the spine of Stacy's race kind of keep you engaged we didn't think everybody knew how it turned out. Um, and we wanted to kind of also peel back into her history and give you some insight into the creation of a political leader. Um, and then how did we kind of constantly rope that back to the history? Um, those were the challenges and those were the kind of like intersections and transitions that, that we find, found to make the film work. Can you talk about a, a little bit the chronology? How long did the film take to make um, and and what does the team look like? How many people are involved? I'm I'm still awed by the amount of archival material and current experts and the narrative arc. It's incredible to me. So, um, on this film, I, I met Stacy last like June of 2019. June, uh, so it was last summer, and um, we all knew we wanted to come out now. Um, before the election. We knew we wanted it to be sort of something that would um, be part of the conversation in this election season. And so that was a little over a year, which for us is a short amount of time to make a film. I mean, I that usually take- seems to me almost crazy how, how yeah. compressed that time period is. That's right. So normally I would, you know, 18 months would be the bare minimum, you know, two years is a little, is kind of, is, is what I would expect myself to, to need. Um, so on this particular film, we had to, we kind of doubled up um, a bit. You know, I, I, I brought on Lisa Cortez, who was my partner on this project. Um, we, she did some interviews. I did some interviews. Um, we broke up sections of the film to work on separately. Um, so I would be working um, with the editor on the Stacy story and she might be going working with the junior editor on, um, you know, making sense of the Shelby case, you know, so and then we would kind of bring it together and it, it didn't come together like a Lego piece, you have to sort of like fix it, but we were, we were doubling up our efforts in order to, to make it happen. We have our archival producer who I say, you know, I really want someone like a man on the street talking about voting, you know, in a different era, you know, so then she goes and she looks for that. Um, you know, um, I need, you know, that shot of John Lewis, you know, there are obvious things you're looking for, but then the less obvious ones are the, the talent of the archival producer when they come up with that, that rare bit of footage. Um, you know, one, one piece of footage that I was just awed by when she found was the piece, um, out, that that actually it came from USC. That was the piece of a of a young boy who's holding a flag outside of a courthouse, outside of a voter registration drive, and a, a police officer is hassling them um, on their on their way out of the courthouse, and actually picks up the American flag that the boy is holding in order to rob it from his hand, as if he doesn't deserve to be connected to this country. Um, and he just holds on to that flag and, and the, the, the force of the police lifts his feet off the ground. Like I hadn't seen that before. So, so there are archival teams working on that. We had two editors, we had assistant editors. So it was about 15 people at the end of the day. Um, and, um, and everyone was just passionate. And then we had a pandemic, <laughs> which right. happened in, in March. And um, all of us had been working together in an edit room and we had to stop that. So that was a whole other level of challenge, um, but you know we met it, and um, thankfully technology enabled that. And just personally, I feel there were certain images that I'd seen before, but in the context in which you showed them, they were doubly moving. I'm thinking about there was a scene. I think it was in the Selma, Alabama county, the courthouse, and there's a. Um, a, a mom holding her son and um, African American, and a police officer strikes the little boy, and the mom yeah, it's clutches a... him. And I mean, it. I, I couldn't speak seeing that, and I, I think the power of film in in that sense is so intense. Yeah. Well, I mean, and you know, you think about the role of there. There were news cameras or docu you know, of of of. Um, the visual medium advancing 
the cause of civil rights, right? Of course, like the Edmund Pettus Bridge and what happened in Selma was what happened in Selma because uh, created the, 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 the political will for the Voting Rights Act because it was caught on film. Bri you know, so not Breonna Taylor, but so many, you know, George Floyd, so many of the stories which are galvanizing the movement for Black Lives today are, um, are, are have their emotional force because we're able to see them and discuss them. And as Carol Anderson said, Jim Crow was so powerful that so much happened in secret, right? Um, and um, so, so yeah, the the, the visual uh, recording of um, of these injustices is, is key, and uh, certainly enables us to make our our argument in the film. We have a, a question from Luca in the audience who asks, "What were some ideas or messages that you and Stacy considered including in the video, but which didn't, but that didn't make it into the final cut? What were they? Mm. Were there any, and, and why didn't they make it in?" Yeah, I mean, there's so much. I mean, first of all, there are heroes uh, whose stories you really wanted to tell. Um, that um, you know, civil rights activists or folks like Amelia Boynton, who we we only mentioned briefly in the film, but she, you know, she has an incredible story. You know, a black woman pre-Voting Rights Act who's running for office and registering voters in Selma, Alabama, Selma, Alabama, um, and um, you know, gerrymandering obviously is a really big issue in terms of protecting our democracy or the destruction of our democracy, depending on which way you look at it. And um, certainly it's something that we only got into a little bit. Um, you know, there were um, other sequences in Georgia about the election there. So there, there, were, there were things, but I think in terms of themes, we, we, we got all the themes in, but were there beats that we didn't get in? Yes, of course. Can you talk a little bit about, I, I know you did a, previously a bit with Stacy, but for either this film or your previous films, what are the kind of follow on steps you take after the film has been released to ensure that the message gets out there? Or are there follow on steps or, or do you really just move on to the next project? Well, it depends. Um, on this film, the same day that we, we decided we were making it and that we got the funding to do so, we said we need to start building an impact campaign, um, which meant raising money, you know, an additional set of money outside of the money that was gonna um, uh, fund the film itself and um, figure out the outreach piece um, because it, it can take, you know, six to eight months to just get the funding. So in this case, we did that alongside the film. So we were ready to go when it came out and we have a really robust social action campaign. Stacy mentioned our website, allinforvoting.com in which, you know, if you're from any state, you can check your registration, your deadlines, you can volunteer. Um, there's all kinds of tools there. Um, we have a 50 state ambassador outreach in which we engaged with, um, celebrities or athletes who have large social media followings to adopt a state um, so that they can disseminate information on that particular state. You know, what's the deadline to register in your state? Um, you know, where do you, uh, you know, where do you uh, drop a ballot in your state? You know, all kinds of state specific, because we don't have one voting system in this country, right? We have 50. So we, we had that state adopt a state ambassadors program um, we're doing a Grow a Voter program with our educational outreach. So in this film, that impact campaign was like, you know, in lockstep with the filmmaking. There are other films that I've made where I finish them and I'm so <laughs> burnt out that I'll say, you know, can an impact, pretty, you can hire that person who then takes the film out and creates a curriculum or partners with nonprofits. But, you know, we did that from the beginning and we're partnered with Southern Poverty Law Center and NAACP and the ACLU and Voto Latino and um, uh, you know many many the Black Votes Ma Black Votes Matter all kinds of organizations who are our partners you know from the get go on getting out the information. I, I wanted to maybe and still people in the audience should keep asking questions, but I wanted to kind of move back a little bit and talk about your career more broadly. You've done films on such an incredible range of topics, so top social justice and incarceration, foreign policy, the arts. Uh, I, you know, I love Marilyn as a, as a terrific film. How do, you, how do you pick the topics or how do you move from one, one area to the next? Hmm. 
Um, I mean, you know, in, in a case like this with All In, it was certainly, you know, dictated by the the, the, the crisis I feel in my, you know, in my sure. soul um, that many of us are experiencing. Um, and, um, but in general, um, you know, a film like the Nina Simone film, right? Why, why did I love to make that film? Um, you know, and people would suggest to me, oh, can you make a film about this artist or that artist? The thing that was so special about Nina's story and what made me drawn to it was, you know, not just that the tremendous prowess as an artist and the rate, you know, the, the innovation of the form, but also the way it dovetailed with social movements, the civil rights movement, um, and also spoke to issues around domestic violence and mental health and all of those other things. So for me, it's like, how do we, you know, how does, how do, you know, our personal lives interconnect with these larger themes and then sort of stay forever kind of eternal and, uh, you know, stay forever relevant. Um, you know, Bobby Fischer, the chess player, you know, it's a, it's a story in the 60s and 70s, um, but it spoke to issues around mental health. Um, it was a story about the Cold War. You know, there were all these other elements that were, I was able to bring in. So I guess I'm looking for those layers um, and, you know, not every story has those layers. Um, um, you know, some people live easier lives. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then, and then in fact, there's, you know, it, it may be less, uh, you know, less documentary, uh, fodder, but, um, you know, and I also made a scripted film this year called Lost Girls, which was a, right. a you know, a, 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 a scripted film on Netflix based on a, a true crime story, which was about the murder of sex workers that went um, unsolved for many, many years, partially because of class and, and you know, issues around gender. And um, so I'm attracted to stories that are great stories, but then also kind of can pull on these other threads that, you know, connect us or disconnect us as a community, as a society. You you mentioned that your father is a, a, a civil rights famous civil rights attorney. Can you talk about other influences on your life that that drove your career or influenced your career? Mm. Well, I you know I had some wonderful professors at Brown. Um, I'll say you know, um, and of course I'm now I'm so old that not everybody's names are gonna are gonna come to me. But I had a you know an amazing women's studies professor at Brown, um, whose name is gone in my brain at the moment. But, you know, also when I was there, it was, um, we did, we had a semiotics major and Marianne Doan, who um, was a feminist film theorist, um, was a huge influence on me um, as a, and I was her TA as I sort of came up in the, in the department. Um, uh, you know, Barbara Koppel, who is a, a wonderful documentary filmmaker, has, was a mentor to me. Um, so, so yeah, there I'm Can you talk answer. about on that same subject your the move from being an undergraduate Brown into filmmaking? Uh, how, how did you make it happen earlier in your earlier in, early in your career, especially before you had really developed a reputation? Um, so I graduated from Brown in 1992, thinking that I was going to take a couple of years off and then go to law school. Um, I then engaged on this voter registration drive in 1992, um, which was organized by a group called the Third Wave, um, and it was the year Clinton was running for president. And we um, we went across the country, and um, that experience, while I'm not sure it was so effective in registering voters because we spent so much time on the road, um, but but the experience of being out in the world um, and having the conversations I was having with people who were not engaged in the system um, because of so many things that some of the earlier questioners pointed to made me feel like while I was really attracted to the law, it still felt like I just didn't want to go back to, like it just felt still too removed from people's realities. Now I saw from my father that you could be a lawyer and fight for people, but I also heard from him quite directly that that was getting harder and harder to do um, in the 90s, after the 80s, that, um, that the, the kind of work that he had done in the 60s was, um, was getting harder and harder to do. And, and I think that that stayed in the back of my mind. Um, and so then I went to assist another filmmaker and um, we were then, um, engaged in some prison work and that and I started working with this other filmmaker and ultimately found through him my first film which was an Angola prison 
Um, and with him, I was able to get that film made. Do you feel, I mean, you didn't go to film school. Um, for students who are interested in pursuing a career in film and documentary filmmaking, how important is it to, to either go to film school or find other avenues to learn the, the technique of, of filmmaking, the art of filmmaking? And how, how does one do that if not through the formal path of film school? Yeah, I mean, I think you can certainly work for other filmmakers and you can get a hands-on um, education in the sort of soups and nuts of what it takes to make a film. That's what I did with this with this uh, filmmaker that I worked for out of college. Um, but I do think film school, if you can afford it, is a great place because you get to practice. Um, and I and there is definitely like things that I regret about you know not having that formal education. Um, certainly, I've I've learned it you know on, in these years, but. Um, but it would have been great. I think it would have been a great confidence builder because you get to try and fail um, in a context where it's very safe to do so. Um, so I think if you can find a great internship or assistant position, I mean, internships are flawed for all kinds of reasons, or assistant position, and you can learn, it's a small enough company where you can learn the soup to nuts, and that's great. But I also think film school has a tremendous value and um, I would never poo poo it. And I, re I regret not having some of that, that basis in my, in my own work. It certainly hasn't held you back. <laughs> well, <laughs> I have to overcompensate. <laughs> <laughs> can, can you talk a little bit about some of the, the other topics that you'd like to do, even follow on ones to, to all in? I mean, there's so much going on in our immediate environment. And I do want to come to, well, what do we do in the midst of or what can students do in the midst of COVID, but what are some of the, the follow-on topics that you'd, you'd really love to do work on? Well, you know, I have to say that, um, you know, the election's November 3rd. I think on November 4th, um, we are gonna be looking at a, a really interesting problem. Um, look, let's hope that it's a landslide and that the whole thing is boring. Um, you know, this is my political, hope. Um, but I think that, you know, in fact, um, it will be a very dicey time, um, November and December, um, as this election and our democracy is litigated in courts that have been um, stacked in the past couple of decades with conservative justices. And it's going to be a fight. It's going to be, you know, a, a, la a, you know, a real tooth and nail fight. Um, I think if that is happens, I personally would be fascinated um, to document the kind of the legal front, the war, you know, that battle, that war room, um, if I could, that would be my dream. Um, after Trump was elected um, in 2016, I, I made a film, a series actually for Showtime called The Fourth Estate, in which I embedded at the Washington Bureau of the New York Times. Um, it was very clear to me right after the election um, that, you know, once he didn't have Hillary to make his, you know, uh, make the, he needed an enemy. And once Hillary was no longer that, that appropriate, you know, that easy enemy for him, that it was going to be the free press. Now, of course, we all know that it's been four years, but at that time it was still new. And so I, I was there living in the New York Times um, and it felt like the center of the universe because, um, you know, Washington was changing so much. And, and so for me, this would be like, the next kind of step of that. I would be really interested to do that if, if I could have the opportunity. You know, you're mentioning uh, being embedded at the Times. It makes me want to ask, how do you persuade people? I mean, in the case of Stacey <laughs> Abrams, it sounded like, she, well, she wanted to do a film, but how do you persuade your subjects to, to, to let you in? I mean, the, the, your films, in many cases, they're so intimate, really, and they, they, they go deep into the people you are covering. And I wonder, why do people allow you to do it. Um, and I'm looking at my own screen and really as, as a filmmaker, I've got the worst lighting in here because the bulb <laughs> just went out in front of me. So it's just fine. Forgive me. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's very gothic. Um, I, the New York Times was really hard, actually. It's, it's funny, you know, the, to, to, from the, the powers that be at the New York Times, the, the, from the company point of view, um, you know, I met with them, I explained to them my goals, I was able to get their blessing. But reporter to reporter, you know, they're the ones who have to deal with me and, and it's annoying, you know, and it, you're incredibly self-conscious, you're dealing with an, an anonymous sources. Um, so there's all kinds of issues, very valid ones, plus just like personal space, you know. And, um, 
And that was really hard. And a lot of it is rolling with the punches. You know, they were under enormous pressure um, that year, you know, scrutiny from the president, scrutiny from the left, feeling like the New York Times had totally failed. You know, there was all this pressure on, on those on those folks. Um, and um, so there would be times where we would get yelled at and thrown out. Um, and I think part of it is just, you know, the patience and, um, and also knowing when no really means no, <laughs> where there are some people who will get mad for a day and then they're like, okay, sorry, yeah, I, you know, they, they want to be part of it. And then there are those people who really just don't, you know, and I think that you just have to respect that. Um, you know, not everybody, you know, some people want to be known for what they do. And for other people, they want to be more under the radar. And I think that it's part of it is like kind of knowing when to say, okay, this just isn't going to work for you and stopping pushing there. But knowing for those people who have that side of themselves that want to talk, want to explain what they're doing, want to bring that, you know, that daylight into their process, that then you can kind of keep, keep knocking at that door. Is there, do you generally reach a moment in these kind of relationships with your subjects at which they kind of start forgetting there's a camera there, or at least it, it, it goes out of their mind. Can you sense that? Yes. Yes, you can. And, um, and it's certainly in places like the times that could be a problem too, right? Because people, um, you do have to be very careful about anonymous sources. And we didn't know if our tapes could get subpoenaed, like we didn't know what this government would do. Um, so while as a filmmaker, it's sort of a dream, you also need your subjects to kind of not forget. And so you, you, you want them to forget, but also, you never want to take advantage. Um, so it's a, it's a fine line. And uh, I know we're running out of time. So those in the audience, if anybody has questions, this is, we just have a minute or two, but I also want to ask you really two questions. One about COVID that we can get to it, but also how has, how have things like Netflix or Amazon prime or Showtime, these channels, these venues, how have they changed your work as a filmmaker? Uh, it's been great for filmmakers. I mean, it, when I started out, it was um, PBS and HBO yeah. where you could make films. And um, there was a small number of people doing it. And documentaries still sort of had that sense of, you know, oh, eat your spinach. Mm -hmm. um, and then, you know, over time, that started to change. Um, the film, uh, one, a film that came out in 1994, uh, that was called Hoop Dreams, mm -hmm. which hopefully people have seen, um, was, you know, there you know, there were films that sort of started to open up the door for people to say, oh, actually, it's really fun to watch a documentary. They're, they're, they can be narrative, you know? And I think that was, once people started to see them as narrative films and not as um, purely teaching tools, um, they started to embrace them more. And then as these, the content, you know, as streamers arose, documentaries do incredibly well on those platforms, you know? Um, you know, and it doesn't, it's not just Tiger King too, you know, right. it's, it shows, which, which did great on Netflix, but it shows like, you know, Dirty Money, which, you know, take a yeah. look at, you know, money and politics. I mean, and there are a lot of shows that people really watch that deal with really interesting issues. And just one last question, especially for the benefit of our students who are eager to, to get involved in filmmaking now, what can they do in, in a time of COVID? This may be with us for a while, what sort of opportunities might be out there for somebody just trying to break in? Well, in documentary film, we're still working. I mean, you can, you can have smaller crews, you can get tested and quarantine, and you can, you can do it. You can form a pod and do it. Um, you can, you can, we can still make films. We can edit one-on-one. -on -one. Today I was in an edit room um, with my editor. We had both been tested. We're getting tested weekly. Um, we can still do that. Um, larger sets um, are more complicated, but that work is starting again as well with really rigorous testing regimes and um, protocols. So obviously we're all don't know exactly what will happen this winter, but right now um, work is getting done and it's being done very carefully. Um, and you know, you can still look to this industry. <laughs> You're giving us hope. Yeah. <laughs> well, Liz Garbus, I want to, Thank, I want to thank you for, for being here today. I want to thank you and congratulate both you and Lisa Cortez on a just an exceptional film, All In, The Fight for Democracy. For those of you, most of you I know here have seen it, but for those of you who haven't, please go see it. It's available on Amazon Prime. Tell your friends to see it. It's a really important work. And Liz, what a, 
what a perfect work and what a perfect conversation really to underscore all of our aspirations for the JFK Jr. Film Initiative. Thank you so much. Thank you for having me. Thank you so much.